Okay, we're set. Hello, friends. Welcome to this 21st webinar on the secret teachings of all ages by Manly P. Hall. This webinar uh, is available on makara.us under the subheading Mori Federation webinars, then webinar series in progress, as shown here. Actually, David Hopper, I think, finished his webinar in March. Yes, he did. And he's getting ready to start a new one in September. But yes, oh. I have to update that. Oh, OK. Uh, previous episodes of this and the Secret Doctrine series are also available on YouTube. Just do a search for Francis Donald's Secret Teachings or Secret Doctrine. OK. Since during our last session, we had just begun the section on the uh, Bacchic or Dionysiac mysteries, let's reread the first paragraph. So could we get a reader, please? Sure, I'll do it. I'll start off. The Bacchic rite centers around the allegory of the youthful Bacchus, Dionysus, or Zagreus, uh, being torn to pieces by the Titans. These giants accomplished the destruction of Bacchus by causing him to become fascinated by his own image in a mirror. After dismembering him, the Titans first boiled the pieces in water and afterwards roasted them. Pallas rescued the heart of the murdered god, and by this precaution, Bacchus, or Dionysus, was enabled to spring forth again in all his former glory. Jupiter, the Demiurgus, beholding the crime uh, of the Titans, hurled his thunderbolt bolts and slew them, burning their bodies to ashes with heavenly fire. Out of the ashes of the Titans, which also contained a portion of the flesh of Bacchus, whose body they had partly devoured, the human race was created. Thus, the mundane life of every man was said to contain a portion of the Bacchic life. Okay, thank you. So any thoughts or questions about this? Uh, we covered this last month, um, particularly gruesome, um myth but it's full of um of uh, very meaningful allegory which we'll explore so um as to the um bacchic rite itself last month we took a look at this image and the accompanying text wherein we discovered that quote the role of bacchus is played by the candidate who set upon by the priest in the guise of the Titans is slain and finally restored to life amidst great rejoicing. So let's take a closer look at the Titans who are similar to the Norse Utans and who quote, accomplish the destruction of Bacchus by causing him to become fascinated by his own image in a mirror. The concept of the Titans is, is a vast one and quite complex. The Theosophical Glossary tells us that they are, quote, builders of worlds, progenitors of human races, and most germane to our story, entities of matter. That is to say, they represent the form aspect. HPB traces their origins to Atlantis, associating them with the, quote, melee of the Atlanteans and Aryans and their supreme struggle, or the conflict between the Devs and the Ezeds, which became ages later, the struggle of Titans separated into two inimical camps, and still later, the war between the angels of gods and the angels of Satan. This duality represents what Albert Pike calls the theory of two principles, uh, basically the theory of good and evil, which has dominated philosophical thought um, forever. So could we get a reader for this uh, Albert Pike quote? 
Sure. Greg, can you read that for us, please? I saw your hand up a minute ago, but I didn't know if you had a. Can you? Greg, can you unmute yourself? There, there you go. Um, yeah. Uh, my only thought was when when he was going through the slides about the idea of the Davic kingdoms, because these people, the, these um, titans came out of the, um, out of the, uh, he said matter, that they were matter based, which, which felt to me like they're kind of like elementals in a sense. But anyway, I just was wondering if there's any relationship from that perspective too, that they're kind of Davic in their own right being kind of um, elemental. Well, you make a good point, you know, because the Davis or the elementals under the David kingdom are form builders, substance makers. Uh, but what we're doing here is translating one discipline into another. Within the, uh, the Greek mythology, um, which is really the Orphic tradition, which really set all this up, but the Titans come especially to the fore in these Bacchic uh mysteries in that tradition they represent the form aspect philosophically um so yeah you can make of that as you will they also literally existed in um uh certain titanic races as like in the latter uh atlantean times so okay Okay, so Plutarch admits that this theory of two principles was the basis of all the mysteries and consecrated in the religious ceremonies and mysteries of Greece, Osiris and Typhon, Ormuz and Ahriman, Bacchus and the Titans and Giants all represented these principles. Bones, the luminous god that issued from the sacred egg and night or the scepters and the mysteries of the new Bacchus in Greece, in the mysteries of the same God honored under the name of Bacchus, a representation was given of his death slain by the Titans of his descent into hell, his subsequent resurrection and his return toward his principal or the pure abode whence he had descended to unite himself with matter. Thank you, Greg. So he's given us a, a series of dualities and, you know, the, uh, the concept of the two principles at war is uh, goes back to the night of time, right? And here's some examples of, of where you find this uh, duality. Uh, by the way, the, um, let's see here, wait a minute. Before we go there. Um, Next, out of the ashes of the Titans, which also contained a portion of the flesh of Bacchus, whose body they had partly devoured, the human race was created. Thus, the mundane life of every man was said to contain a portion of the Bacchic life. So we get into the philosophy of it here. So both uh, Joseph Campbell and G.R.S. Mead, a great theosophist, uh, turn of the century theosophist, expand on this titanic slash Bacchic dual nature of humanity. So could we get a reader for these two quotes, please? Lynn, can you read them for us, please? Yes, can you put the bar down again? Because I had to unmute. You okay. see I'm just losing the last piece of it. Such, however, was not the idea of the Greeks of the mystery tradition who told of Zeus creating man, not from lifeless dust, but from the ashes of the Titans who had consumed his son Dionysus. Man is in part, therefore, of a mortal Dionysian substance, though in part also of Titanic mortal and in the mystery initiations, he is made cognizant of the portion within him of the ever living God who died to himself to live manifold in us all. Now, Ficinus says that because men were 
generated from the Titans who had been nourished with the body of Dionysus, he, Orpheus, therefore calls them Dionysical, as though some of their members were, were from the Titans and came from Dionysus, so that the human body is partly a Dionysical psychic and partly of a mundane physical nature. For the smoke from the ashes of the Titans become, became matter, we are told. The Platonists called Dionysus our master, or the mind in us is Dionysical and is thus the image of Dionysus, the mundane soul. Okay, thoughts or questions about this quote? By the way, the subject matter of this fabulous mosaic is not just an artist's whimsy. Here we have the Bacchic slash Titanic nature of a human portrayed in their right relation, not unlike the Sagittarian uh, as master of the white horse, uh, or the maiden opening the lion's mouth in the strength arcanum of the Tarot, all three representing mastery over the form aspect. Notice how the panther's head looks more like a more human than cat. The meaning is made all the more clear by Bacchus's wand called a thyrsus or thyrsus, which Thomas Taylor tells us signifies the quote, diffusion of the higher nature into the sensible form, a kind of spiritual lightning rod, if you will. Uh, but more on the thyrsus in a bit. Next up, can we get a reader, please? Yes, Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Bacchus Dionysus represents the rational soul of the inferior world. He is the chief of the Titans, the arti artif artificers of the mundane spheres. The Pagoreans called him the Titanic monad. Thus, Bacchus is the all-inclusive idea of the Titanic sphere and the Titans, or gods of the fragments, the active agencies by means of which universal substance is fashioned into the pattern of this idea. The Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul in a state of self-knowledge, and the Titanic state, the diversity of the rational soul, which being scattered throughout creation, loses the consciousness of its own essential oneness. The mirror into which Bacchus gazes and which is the cause of his fall is the great sea of illusion, the lower world fashioned by the Titans. Bacchus, the mundane rational soul, seeing his image before him, accepts the image as a likeness of himself and ensouls the likeness, that is, the rational idea ensouls its reflection the irrational universe. By ensouling the irrational image, it implants in it the urge to become like its source, the rational image. Therefore, the ancients said that man does not know the gods by logic or by reason, but rather by realizing the presence of the gods within himself. Thank you, Carrie. So the takeaway from this paragraph is the Bacchic state, <clears throat> You have this duality, right? Bacchic and Titanic that makes up a human being. The Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul. And here's the, the takeaway. In a state of self-knowledge. So the Bacchic state signifies self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-becoming, self-knowing, um, all those qualities. The Titanic state um, is the diversity of the irrational soul, which being scattered throughout creation, loses the consciousness of its own essential oneness. So there's the fundamental duality. Any thoughts or questions about this? That's the crux of the, of the myth and of the mystery. This paragraph strongly informed by the ideas of Thomas Taylor represents MPH at his best. It's beautifully written. First, Bacchus, Dionysus, represents the rational soul of the inferior world. 
This short sentence represents a profound teaching. Let's take a, take a closer look at Thomas Taylor's thoughts on this subject. Can we get a reader, please? Karen, can you read that for us, please? In the first place, then, by Dionysus or Bacchus, according to the highest conception of this deity, we understand the spiritual part of the mundane soul. For there are various processions or avatars of this God or Bacchus's derived from his essence. But by the Titans, we must understand the mundane gods of whom Bacchus is the highest. By Jupiter, the Demiurgus or artificer of the universe, by Apollo, the deity of the sun, who has both a mundane and a super mundane establishment and by whom the universe is bound in symmetry and consent through splendid reasons and harmonizing power. And lastly, by Minerva, we must understand that uh, origin, the original, we must, must understand that original intellectual ruling and providential deity who guards and preserves all middle lives in an immutable condition through intelligence and a self-supporting life, and by this means sustains them from the degradations and inroads of matter. Thank you, Karen. Okay, um, in theosophy, the spiritual part of the mundane soul is called the imprisoned soul, which is characterized by the spark of mind, whose essence is solar fire which Taylor tells us properly belongs to the realm of the Titans. Thus, Bacchus, who represents each of us, is the exalted product of titanic evolution, a concept symbolized by Bacchus riding the lion with thyrsus in hand, in the same attitude as that depicted in the mosaic of the panther. Finally, Taylor describes the specific aspects of Bacchus's nature as personified by Jupiter, Apollo, and Minerva. Any thoughts or questions about this quote? The Pythagoreans called Bacchus the titanic monad because his intellect represents the highest possible attainment within, theosophically speaking, the third principle, or titanic realm. This quality is personified by Bacchus, who lifts his inner gaze to Minerva, possibly depicted here, uh, shown marking the illusory earthly time of Bacchus's incarnation with her hand symbols, much like, I'm sure you're all familiar with that statue of Shiva, where he's uh, clicking the drum and you get that same idea. Notice that he doesn't look directly at her, but he seems to be influenced by her. Her role is um, worth repeating. That original intellectual ruling and providential deity who guards and preserves all middle lives in an immutable condition middle meaning between the titanic life and the life free of matter, um, such as the soul is. So the middle lives being that Bacchic condition. We complete the lower trilogy by expanding the detail one figure to the left where we find Apollo, who seems to be joined to Bacchus's torso because indeed we are one with the logos. Any thoughts or questions? Next, thus Bacchus is the all-inclusive idea of the titanic sphere and the titans or gods of the fragments, the active agencies by means of which universal substance is fashioned into the pattern of this idea. Gods of the fragments references the powers by which the material world is formed. Uh, Greg was mentioning this in terms of the elementals. In theosophy, the third principle, the quote, 
pattern of this idea is personified by Bacchus, the all-inclusive idea embedded within the titanic sphere, the soul in man. We had a very similar idea with uh, Persephone in the realm of Hades, right? She's, she's very Bacchic in that sense, um, wedded to the form aspect, but not herself that. Next, the Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul in a state of self-knowledge and the titanic state, the diversity of the rational soul, which being scattered throughout creation, loses the consciousness of its own essential oneness. As I mentioned before, this is, this is the essence of the, the myth. The self-knowledge aspect of the Bacchic state reminds me of that famous verse from the Bhagavad Gita that reads, having pervaded the universe with a fragment of myself, I remain. In the same way, Bacchus participates in diversity as the unifying principle. The difference between, of course, is that um, Krishna is free and stands outside as the self-aware unified principle but also aware of, of himself as the uh, diversity of beings who have been fragmented by the titanic or form aspect. Is this starting to make sense? I hope so. As mentioned before, this concept of unity and diversity is represented by Bacchus's staff called a thyrsus. This is a really cool teaching. Again, because of his esoteric orientation, we'll call on Thomas Taylor. Could we get a reader, please? Yvonne, can you read that for us, please? And lastly, the thesis itself, which was used in the Bacchic procession, as it was a reed full of knots, is an apt symbol of the diffusion of the higher nature into the sensible world. And agreeable to this, Olympio, Olympiodorus on the Fido observes that the theresis is a symbol of a forming anew of the material and parted substance from its scattered condition. And that on this account, it is a titanic plant. This, it was customary to extend before Bacchus instead of his paternal scepter. And through this, they called him down into our partial nature. Indeed, the Titans are Theresis bearers and Prometheus concealed fire in a Theresis or reed, after which he is considered as bringing celestial light into generation or leading the soul into the body or calling forth a divine illumination, the whole being ungenerated into generated existence. Hence, Socrates calls the multitude theresis bearers or fickly as living according to a titanic life. Thank you. Okay. Um, so important here is the idea that instead of his paternal scepter, which would have been, uh, since he's the son of the Logos, um, it would, would have like uh, the scepter of the sun. He carries this thyrsus um, in order to be able to bring that uh, solar fire into humanity, okay? So when he's bearing it, he's able to, um, it acts as a medium, um, which he himself is, as Orf, as as Bacchus, in incarnation. He, in a sense, himself is a thyrsus, right? Um, and when it's carried by one of his acolytes, then it acts as a median, in order to receive that potency. Okay. Um, in Charles right. Ledby. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you have a comment here from um, Efrosini. 
I'm sorry if I'm saying uh -huh. your name wrong. Uh, anyway, she says the symbol of Bacchus has been associated more with ecstasy, transcendence than self-knowledge. He is the one who gets drunk, who causes rage in conventional people. Yeah, there, you know, the Dionysiac mysteries um, um, became, um, what's the word I want? Um, uh, degraded uh, over time. Um, you know, every mystery school, just like an art, moves from a primitive where the uh, ideas are conceived and then into the classical era where they're perfected and you could say form the the highest expression of those that philosophy or art and then you you enter a rococo period where the form aspect dominates over the philosophical aspect or the form aspect of the art um, dominates the the um the message aspect of the art. And I think that's what we had with Dionysus, especially in the latter stages, it became um, sort of, um, you know, um, infamous for having uh, become quite degraded. But in its earlier stages, that would not have been the case. Okay, um, you know, and there's, there's a number of, this very symbol, suggests that absolute dominance over the personality nature, the, you know, the ability to completely control one's personality aspect, right? Uh, kind of the opposite of drunken debauchery. Okay, let's read this Charles Ledbetter um, quote from The Inner Life, where he talks uh, even more specifically about this uh, Thyrsus, which you see in both, both illustrations. Can we get a reader? Jesse, can you read that for us, please? Uh, can you unmute yourself? Well, I'm not getting her unmuted. Um, Jan, can you read that for us, please? Well, I'm not getting her unmuted either. I noticed Scott has joined us if you wanna read her. Okay, Scott, you're up. Okay. There you go. Yay. Someone's here. In some modifications of the mysteries, a hollow iron rod said to contain fire was used instead of the thyrsus. Here again, it is not difficult for the student of occultism to see the meaning. The staff or the stick with seven knots represents the spinal cord with its seven centers of which we read in the Hindu books. But the thyrsus was not only a symbol, it was also an object of practical use. It was a very strong magnetic instrument used by initiates to free the astral body from the physical when they passed in full consciousness to this higher life. The priest who had magnetized it laid it against the spinal cord of the candidate and gave him in that way some of his own magnetism to help him in that difficult life and in the efforts which lay before him. Okay, you should come to recognize when you've peeled back one layer of the veil, and this is definitely that kind of a teaching, which Charles Leadbeater is, or Leadbeater, I think it actually is. Uh, I know we all want to say lead better, but it's Leadbeater. Uh, he's famous for these kind of insights because he was a um, clairvoyant and a uh, initiate. So any thoughts or questions about this provocative um, passage? This is quite extraordinary. I've not seen this before from anyone. Yeah, I hadn't either. Uh, actually, I only ran across it um, 
tangentially when I was doing a search for um, um, for Atlantis, and it turns out that and it showed up. Uh, but it's um, yeah, it's I interjected it because it's it's um, so extraordinary. Uh, gives you some insight into if nothing else what we don't know about the kind of stuff that went on in these mystery schools, right? That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So next we have the mirror, one of the most ingenious metaphors in the Bacchic myth. The soul wishing to incarnate fixes its gaze on quote, the great sea of illusion, the lower world fascinated by the Titans, but not until it quote, accepts the image as a likeness of himself and then souls the likeness. Notice here the, that the, um, there's a willingness to ensoul the likeness here. There's no entrapment. Uh, so not until that happens, is that soul propelled into incarnation, into the realm of fragments, metaphorically represented by the Titans tearing the infant Bacchus into seven pieces, which of course represent the seven natures, right? Seven bodies on each of the seven planes of the uh, uh, cosmic physical plane. So any thoughts or questions about that? Jesse says it's similar to Sanat Kumara's rod. Oh, you mean the rod of initiation? Yeah, it's 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 more passive than that. Um, notice that he would place it against the spine in order to um, magnetize one's own natural potencies. Where uh, when you when that Sanat's rod um, actually is fohotic, it's it's um, uh, positively electrical in nature and literally st stimulates the uh, mental and astral bodies um, in ways that it was not before, right? Uh, but yeah, they, <laughs> they certainly have a bare resemblance to each other. Um, She says, yes, she agrees um, in the difference. And um, uh, Efrosini says, can we connect the myth with the soul that enters the three worlds and permeates them with the seven rays? Oh, absolutely. In fact, there's, there's probably, if you were to actually, if you were actually privy to the actual mysteries, remember, we're looking at all of this from without trying to interpret the symbols. But if you were able to look into it and, and actually um, know, you know the content of this mystery school, I would think you would find a direct correlation um, to our modern theosophical uh, teachings and all the methods whereby initiation uh, and, and um, the various purifications, all of it have direct correlation. Right. So it's, it's kind of like a great puzzle that we try to unravel through its symbols, like the thyrsus, you know. OK, uh, next, by ensouling the irrational image, it implants in it the urge to become like its source, the rational image. Now, a word about rational and irrational here. Um, the Buddhic plane is called in theosophy um, the logical or rational plane. And of course, rational doesn't mean uh, effective use of the lower mind. It has a much higher orientation than that. You could say it means to be in keeping with um, the purpose as, as it is expressed through the plan. So irrationality is basically being out of sync or out of touch and out of phase with the plan, right? Which, and that's what the Titanic life is, is, is um, irrational in that sense. 
Parenthetically, there's also irrational numbers, which, uh, you know, I make a, I champion the cause of them being renamed super rational numbers because in fact, they are the means by which um, the evolutionary path and the evolutionary path are um, bridged, you could say. They're very phohatic in that way, such as pi and phi, right? But I'm getting off track here. Let's see. So by installing the irrational image, it implants in it the urge to become like its source, the rational. So that implantation is bacchic, right? Therefore, the ancients said that man does not know the gods by logic or by reason, meaning, you know, lower mind, but rather by realizing the presence of the gods within himself. So this represents the inevitable triumph of the evolutionary path, you know, that bacchic implantation um, resulting in soul infusion or in bacchic terms, reattainment of the rational image. Language is a little different. Theosophy, the philosophy is the same. Francis, yeah. you, got, you got a couple of hands up. Greg's was up first and then Scott. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Greg. Um, I was thinking, because uh, you guys are referring back that you go to the third world, but yet the human kingdom that we live in at that, at which point we believe or we try to um, embody and in, in, that we're in soul beings because at the fourth kingdom, the human and the soul are the highest goal is um, uh, integration of the um, personality with the soul. Now is the Titanic described here then a reference to a, a point that when we start to attain consciousness from an individual level and then uh, take that approach and see it as the third kingdom uh, being transitioned into the fourth which is what we the how i understand we live is in the fourth kingdom uh well the short answer would be yes the it, you have to remember it in one of the, to me, the most fascinating um, aspects of this teaching is that Bacchus is Titanic. That is to say, it is the um, highest aspect of the Titanic monad, you could say. It's, it is the Titanic monad, right? Meaning very much in theosophical speak, that would mean that the mind is the highest attainment of the third principle or of the form nature, right? The form mental nature, plane okay. is still the form aspect. Now the third becomes the fifth by means of the fourth. In some ways, the idea of a fourth kingdom is a kind of an illusion because what we are is fifth kingdom Bacchuses uh, ensouled in third kingdom bodies which <laughs> okay yeah okay. right yeah. which together yeah. make up and this this is what they were trying to express with this idea of the bacchic titanic human right mm -hmm. um together that forms the fourth kingdom so that, did that answer all your questions yeah. no? great i think so yeah <laughs> okay it, it's the it's the usage of the terminology in a way and trying to associate and substitute using laws of analogy and other things to kind of bring it to the forefront where we can understand it from the mental place and right. also have a balancing process occur in our own soul infused process. Right. You know, the whole purpose of, of especially um, symbolism, metaphor, mythology, as I see it, is to stimulate the intuition. You know, it you by having this translated into um mythical um embodiments and symbols then it's it stimulates you to to find the the unifying factor yet again in another language and we get this over and over we've been doing this you know for the last couple of years looking at this mythology and coming to the same conclusions 
through different um, emphases. You know, the um, the Norsemen and the the Udanic uh, mythology has a very different emphasis than, for instance, the than all the Greek mythology. You know, which is primarily Orphic. With and it has much more feminine participation, right? Um, so it, each one, um, I think, also appeals to different ray types, but it, it's it's like arriving at the same conclusions mentally, but um, with a deeper understanding uh, as a result of of that different approach. All right. So Scott. I I was just going to put in a plug for Fohat uh, <laughs> for this implanting the urge. Well, what is the urge and what's doing it? Um, mm -hmm. What's real? How do you realize the presence of the gods? I think we got a five letter word going there. It's Fohat is the means between any two. Yeah, indeed. You know, when you think of that, the essential nature of Fohat, um, it bridges substance and spirit, period, you know, and all bri all bridging um, is phohatic. It's done, you know, through uh, intelligent electrical um, bridging. And so, yes, absolutely. Any, in, you know, whenever you see a word like embedding, you know that it is a function of phohat, right? Uh, the soul itself, seems to me to be purely phohatic. Now, you know, those those great Venusian beings on their own plane, that's that's you know, that's another discussion. But the um uh, that quality that we call soul is um inherently phohatic because it bridges personality and monad or you know our fragmented selves and our essential nature. So yeah, thanks for the plug. Yeah I'm a, I'm putting in a plug also for Mercury because I'm in the curial. That's phohatic as well. well it, Mercury as being phohatic. Oh, yeah, it's phohat. Yeah, so, it, you know, save a bit more. Oh, just just because that's his role. He is the he bridges. Um, Messenger of the gods. Between anything, any two, whether it's from twilight to, uh, you know, from darkness, light to darkness, light. or just anything that binds together relates yeah. it's electrical and so on. Anyway, just putting in a plug for full hot mercury today. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think of, you know, the Ray uh, assignation of mercury, you know, which is the mediator between the pairs, you know, as, as a fourth ray planet, mm -hmm. at least in the soul aspect. I like the idea of the soul being seen simply as phohotic and that relationship that's um, yeah. actually so which is the nature of the sun anyway right the yeah nature. the nature of the sun right s-o-n sun yeah the third person in um, and duality that's what makes it work right yeah if you if you if you all could visualize a vesca pieces um and the center section, um, which is that almond-shaped section, that's where they come together. That's the infusion, right? Uh, and that's where the sun is born. You know, literally in, in Chart, they show Christ coming out of a vesica pieces, you know? So it's, and the, if there's, that's the, the blending of the nature, which um, theosophy teaches us is, that Fohatic principle, right? Or made possible through Fohat. Good stuff. Okay, Let's see, where are we? Okay, we have another comment from Efrosini. She says, maybe Dionysus soul entered into us to gradually acquaint us with the presence of the God Monad so that we do not have the fate of Semele, his mother, when she saw Zeus. She could not bear it and was consumed. I like that. Yeah, I like that. I, you know, um, 
yeah, proper steps must be taken, you know, um, that's, you know, that's, those types of stories, and there's a few of them in mythology, you know, like of, of Semele, where, you know, there's a premature connection, which burns out the, of course, you know, there is no real death, there's just the um, setback as a result of um, not going through the steps. But yes, Dionysius is the thyrsus, which is that radiatory, uh, no, that's not the right word. It's that bridging mechanism, the thyrsus, right? I mean, lead beater, lead beater <laughs> tells us that it's, you know, the seven knots really are our spinal column. Well, our own centers are that gradually unfolding intermediary stations by which we move from titanic awareness to bacchic awareness, right? And there seems to be a very, I think, a very second ray. Somebody was, you know, mentioning the uh, the ecstatic aspect, and I think originally there was a very second and sixth uh, ray quality to that. So I would think that the bacchic principle resides in the heart. It would just be my take on that. Okay, let's see where are we here. After, okay, we're there. Right. Okay. Next up. Can we get a reader for this, please? Yes. Joan, can you read that for us, please? After Bacchus gazed into the mirror and followed his own reflection into matter, the rational soul of the world was broken up and distributed by the Titans throughout the mundane sphere of which it is the essential nature. But the heart or source of it, they could not scatter. The Titans took the dismembered body of Bacchus and boiled it in water symbol of immersion in the material universe, which represents the incorporation <clears throat> of the Bacchic principle in form. The pieces were afterwards roasted to signify the subsequent ascension of the spiritual nature out of form. Well, I'm not so sure about that last interpretation, but um, so question for you. Um, why couldn't they scatter the heart? But the heart or source of it, they could not scatter. Why is that not scatterable? <laughs> I mean, the myth, the way the myth uh, describes it is um, that the um, Minerva principle, which is embodied by Minerva, uh, save, grabs the heart away you know, from the Titans and saves it, you know, and then Zeus swallows it, which is a way of saying incorporates it into the essentially spiritual, right? And thereby um, Bacchus was saved, you know, from being forever scattered into the realm of uh, material, right? But what is it about the heart that keeps that from happening? Any thoughts? Yes, we have uh, Trudy. Go ahead, please. The, the heart is the, um, the gut part, really, of, of the physical being. That was my, my impression. The Did you get that, Bill? No, I'm sorry. I, it was a little low. Um, can you, can you repeat it? Oh. Go right yeah. up to your mic with your voice, if you would, please. Okay. Um, uh, you're dropped out altogether. I'm sorry, Trudy. Um, now? Try again. Um, Go ahead. The, the, heart, the heart is the, um, the essence of the, the 
the body, the, the essence of the divine in the body. Yeah, okay, I heard you that time. It's the unifying principle. It's in fact doesn't really belong to, you know, we're not talking about the pump. We're talking here about the uh, that to which the silver thread is attached, right? Yeah. The the life principle, which like you say, it's the essence. And um there's nothing to boil, right? There's nothing to chop up. It's it's uh it's beyond the the vagaries of the of the lower nature okay um so for this reason oh theosophy teaches that the life or silver thread is attached to the heart and links us to the source of our being for this reason quote palace rescued the heart of the murdered god and by this precaution Bacchus, Dionysus, was enabled to spring forth again in all his former glory. As here depicted, notice Pallas's uh, Bacchic headdress, um, or Dionysian headdress, really, and the infant Bacchus's little horns, representing his essentially titanic nature. I love that. Um, by the way, the uh, Greek palace is the Egyptian Neith, uh, a kind of savior goddess, who in one of her aspects is Athena. Can we get a reader for the, uh, BL, maybe you could just read this short. Sure, I will. But first, I want to say that um, Karen had typed in the life force as, as you and Trudy mm -hmm. were talking. And then Jesse says, the heart acts like a phohatic chalice from the fifth mm. to the third realms. A phohatic chalice. Oh, you get the special gold star for that one. I like that. Uh, okay. Could you read All right. This? All right. Plutarch refers to an inscription on a sta statue of Pallas, which he renders, I am everything which hath been and which is and which shall be. And there hath never been any who hath uncovered or revealed my veil. Uh, sound familiar? Like maybe it's the inspiration for the title of HPB's Isis Unveiled. When we reference a more complete telling of the Bacchic myth, we discovered that the mirror was only one of the many objects given the infant Bacchus by his father Zeus. Joe Campbell, Joe Campbell tells us, and we read this last time, but I just want to focus on this one sentence. The infant's toys were a ball, a top, dice, some golden apples, a bit of wool, and a bull roarer. Charles Leadbeater, Leadbeater, who puts forward the idea that Orpheus represents the logos, and we'll get more on that later. Remember, he's the son or the personification of the solar aspect, hypothesizes on the meaning of his toys. And I think like before, you'll see the, the particularly esoteric quality of this interpretation. Could we get a reader, please? Carrie, can you read that for us, please? When you go over the lists of the toys of Bacchus, you will find them very remarkable. Whilst the child Bacchus, the Logos, plays with his toys, he is seized by the Titans and torn to pieces. Later, these pieces are put together and built into a whole. You will understand that this, however clumsy it may seem to us, is without doubt an allegory, which represents the descending of the one to become the many and the reunion of the many in the one through suffering and sacrifice. What then are the toys of the child Bacchus when he falls into matter and becomes the many? In the first place, we find him playing with dice. Those dice are not common dice, but the five platonic solids, a set of five regular figures, the only regular polygons possible in geometry. They are given in a fixed series, and this series agrees with the different planes of the solar system. Each of them indicates not the form of the atoms of the different planes, but the lines along which the power works, which surrounds those atoms. 
These polygons are the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. If we put the point in one end and the sphere at the other, we get a set of seven figures corresponding to the number of planes of our solar system. Another toy with, with which Bacchus played was a top, the symbol of the whirling atom of which you will find a picture in occult chemistry. He also plays with a ball which represents the Earth, that particular part of the planetary chain to which the thought of the Logos is specially directed at the moment. Also, he plays with a mirror. The mirror has always been a symbol of astral light in which the archetypal ideas are reflected and then materialized. So you see that each of those toys indicates an essential part in the evolution of a solar system. Yeah, you could say the involution in a way. Thanks, Carrie. There's a particularly occult line here. Um, right here. Each of them, we're talking about these platonic solids, indicates not the forms of the atoms of the different planes. I mean, that's occult enough. But the lines along which the power works, which surrounds those atoms. Do you get a sense of how occult that is? Okay, so what he's saying is that these, these regular solids, these platonic solids, represent the, the lines along which the power uh, works, which surrounds the atoms, and that that varies from plane to plane. Yeah. Any thoughts or questions about anything in this? I love this little Giovanni Bellini picture. If I was going to paint a, of a, a god in, as an infant, I'd say that's a pretty good rendition. So, like father, like son, whether logos or the, quote, rational soul of the inferior world, you know, our Bacchic um, entrapped uh, spirit essence, the path of descent from unity to diversity is the same, right? Next up, can we get a reader, please? Trudy, can you read that for us, please? Oh, it's not going to work. Sorry, Trudy, we'd love to have you read, but your audio is really distorted. Wait, let's get somebody else. Okay. Lynn, can you read that for us, please? Yes, except for the last few lines. When Jupiter, the father of Bacchus and the Demiurgus of the universe, saw that the Titans were hopelessly involving the rational or divine idea by scattering its members through the constituent parts of the lower world, he slew the Titans in order that the divine idea might not be entirely lost. <clears throat> From the ashes of the Titans, he formed mankind, whose purpose of existence was to preserve and eventually to release the Bacchic idea or rational soul from the titanic fabrication. Jupiter being the demiurgus and fabricator of the material universe is the third person of the creative triad. Consequently, the Lord of death, for death exists only in the sphere of being over which he presides. Disintegration takes place so that reintegration may follow upon a higher level a form or intelligence. The thunderbolts of Jupiter are emblematic of his disintegrative power. They reveal the purpose of death, which is to rescue the rational soul from the devouring power of the irrational nature. Somewhere in, in your Zoom um, um, preferences, there's a way of of having that toolbar retreat, Lynn, so that you don't have this problem. He and was, you can B. also put trying, it, Sorry, B.O. was trying to help me with that. And no, yeah. no success. No go. I know uh, Martha Gallagher also has this problem. But yeah, I couldn't find it. We tried to find it beforehand. We couldn't find it. Anyway. Francis. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and Veronica says, uh, she asked the question, the line along which the power works, what does he mean? 
Hmm. Okay. Well, let's go right back to Fohat and you'll get some understanding. Um, there are said to be seven, here's what she's talking about folks. Each of them indicates not the form of the atoms in the different place, but the lines along which the power works which surrounds those atoms. That power is electrical in nature. The um, metaphorically, the Fohat is described as seven Fohatic brothers. That's because they, their energetic form, which is electrical in nature, um, demonstrates in seven different ways on each plane at a higher level. Now, um, so it's the potency to answer your question directly. Directly. It's the potency by which um, atoms are configured uh, and the potency of coherency is um, determined by this particular electric power, right? So the Fohatic method or essence even of the on the buddhic plane is is um somewhat different than that on the mental or that on the atmic right each plane has its own uh power essence phohatic essence um and it's difficult you know uh, language kind of kind of falls out when you try to get closer than that um, there would be a very much a vibratory quality that would accompany this, what's called power here, the way which power works. And in fact, I think that's what you come in contact with as you uh, move into awareness of these higher planes is this phohatic potency, right? And it also is the means by which um, these planes are formed, Right, and those in some way are indicated by these platonic solids. It's really a, a astonishing teaching, of which we only get just the littlest glimpse of. I saw uh, Scott's hand go up there. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Um, it's too bad you can't show those. Uh... Beautiful 3D constructions you made of these solids. I think Thank you. what might be um, brought in on this subject is the fact that the that these solids are made up of angles on a particular figures. And they're either three-sided, four-sided, or five-sided. That's Pythagorean numbers right there, whether you're talking about a tetrahedron, cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, icosahedron. Right. It's it's the fact that they're made up of those basic three, but the angles between them, which is where the way the electricity moves and forms, is different. Yeah, I think you're onto something there. That the uh, that's where the power kind of like lines of power along the sides yeah. of those figures and through them. I like that. Yeah, I like that. It's it's very much like the idea of irrational numbers, right? It's it's the means by which uh, the, the, the merely, the, the form aspect is conditioned, right? So the, the lines between the faces represent that. Um, I mean, this is, you know, this is speculation folks that, you know, Scott and I are doing at this point, but it's, uh, I like it. It's, I think that's likely to be the, the, um, lines of phohatic influence, you might say. Uh, so I don't know if everybody follow what Scott said, but you know, if you take a figure like a cube, um, it's made up of, of um, squares, right? Four-sided figures. Uh, whereas the, um, you find the triangle in both the tetrad and the tetrahedron, you know, which are very, very different figures, but they're both have triangular faces. And then, Uniquely, the dodecahedron has five sides. It, you know, it's a pentagon with five sides. It's made up of 12 pentagons, right? It's considered the highest of these. In fact, it was so high 
that um, in Greek times, it was considered a secret. The existence of the dodecahedron was a, sick, was a secret. Uh, at least that's what I read. Okay. Francis. Yeah. Um, Anne Veronica says the tetrahedron is the symbol of fire. And then she also says, so do we mean the power encloses the atoms and they work on the platonic solids? I was wondering if it shows the uh, Spirelli. Well, we are getting into the Spirelli, yeah. Um, the Spirelli are activated also depending on the subplane and it's, it's, all, it's all the same. Right. So when you move from the third to the fourth spirale and from the fourth to the fifth spirale, then you're looking at an at a complete different energetic system related, but different. And that's, you know, described as one of the Fohatic essences or brothers Fohat, right, that is conditioning. And I think the ability to experience it is determined by the spirale awakened in your atomic structure but we're gonna we're gonna leave folks behind here if we get too deep into that right um and so there is something in these platonic solids that is indicative of the nature of a subplane of the cosmic physical plane right and that part and parcel with that are these lines along which the power works which surround the atoms. So it's, you know, and that's, so you have the atomic structure and you have the, the potency which uh, configures uh, that atomic structure. I see Scott again. I was gonna say, um, we were having trouble in weeks past, uh, I don't know if it was on this or the other webinar of coming up with with the progression of steps three, five, seven, we're having trouble coming up with things for five. Three and seven show up all the time. Here's where our five are, it's the platonic solids. That we need to factor in there and work with that. And, and what could you say a little bit more? How, does, how do they represent five? Because there are five of them only. Oh, I see, yeah. I, it was mentioned in passing, I think in, in HPB, but um, right. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, in the um, in the verse that's coming up, she directly references the fifth step. So she it's funny. You're right. She kind of went. I think she even says the three and seven are whatever, right? right. And then she talks about the continents and the races, etc. But um, she approaches that more directly. Um, whenever you get to five, you're looking at monastic, right, um, in its orientation. Yeah, that and uh, that five being an incomplete seven. You know, five have appeared, two are yet to come kind of deal. It, yeah, and also, you know, when you look at Atmic as the, as the will, you know, buddhic as love and manas as the um, form aspect, then you have the, the, the two that are missing um, and really beyond the purview of human achievement in that the final uh, monadic and sea of fire, which lie above there, right? Um, because the atma buddhi manas is really the, the highest of the human nature. The monad stands above that and directs that reality. Um, and, and therefore it's appropriate for whoever the writer was to add in the extra two, the final two, in terms of the point in the sphere. Because they're not really in there, but they're beyond it and they're source of the other five. Yeah, so you have Atma and the five, you know, Atma being the first of the five below. But you also have another five, which is um, dropping the two bottom ones out. And you have the, you know, the five true 
qualities. And, and DK talks about this at some point. So you have, you know, the uh, the Adi, monadic, atmic, buddhic, and monastic, right? And there is no astral. And the, the in physical is but an illusion, right? So there's that way of looking at five too. It works as it should, whether you count from the top down or the bottom up, the, the last right. two are right. beyond in some That's way. That's right, yeah. And of course, you know, the two to come, you know, it's like you, you see this a lot when you see pictures of Prajapati or HPB07, they're, they're, you know, seven uh, Dhyani Chohans. Um, but if you look at any Hindu um, uh, painting of the, of the Dhyani Chohans, there are only five, you know, that's because we're in this fifth cycle right now, you know, in the fifth root race. And so only five, the two are, are not yet manifest. Which kind of suggests that maybe Plato knew of two others, but we aren't ready for them yet. In some way. You know, I, gosh, again, going back to an HPB reference where she, she talks about being able to see the platonic solids from one of the higher planes. And she says, and then she just shifts and says, it is here that you will understand what it actually means to um, square the circle. <laughs> it is just like, huh? <laughs> yeah, so. Promises, good. Okay, forward. Uh, no. Oh, no way, huh? <laughs> Um, Joan says five comes into play in masonry. Right, that's true. And then Anne Veronica says in the pentagonal dodecahedron is made of pentagons, five. It is the symbol of the universe. Yeah, it's often ascribed to that. You know, it, one of the reasons is that the twelveness is cosmic. Uh, as opposed to the tenness being the perfect human and more systemic, like the seven and three, for instance, which is systemic. But when you get into 12, you get into a cosmic reference, like, for instance, the zodiac, and it's, you know, 12 partitions of the sun, uh, which we'll actually get into. We find out that the sun itself is, a, is bacchic in that it is, it too has been divided, right? But we're not there yet. And then she also adds, I wonder if it has to do with the monastic nature of the universe. And as you said, the fifth round. Yeah, monastic nature of the universe. Well, let's see. Um, you know, when you when you look at the uh, central spiritual sun as comic as cosmic monastic, then in at least our universe is monastic. Also, the fact of its existence, right, or divine ideation, you know, which is certainly connected um, um, with with manas. The very fact of its of its existence comes through divine ideation. Universe is an idea that was impressed onto form through fohat. So, in that sense, you know, it's. <laughs> It's Mahatic is really what it is. Mahat, remember, same dude, two hats, uh, Mahat and Fohat. Well, one is the vehicle and the other is that which is carried in that vehicle, which is the cosmic ideation to be impressed on the entire universe. But from our perspective, um, the cosmic spiritual sun is the source of our uh, solar logos. And that is inherently monastic, Agni, right? Oh, big gosh, you're gonna, we're going to go afield here. Probably should pull it back in, folks. Anyone else relevant to the material here? It's all relevant. I'm fine with these. Uh, no, that's the last one. Is that it? Okay. Okay, what do we got here? Scattering, let's see. 
Scattering members of the divine idea throughout the lower world can only be done through incarnation, whether it's solar or cosmic or personal, by which those who incarnate become identified with the fragmented material aspect. From a theosophical perspective, slaying the Titans refers to one of three events. The gradual dominance of spirit over form by means of the path of evolution. Two, entering into Pralaya at the end of a cycle, at which time the form aspect is transcended, only to be reintroduced in a more evolved form during the next cycle. And finally, three, temporarily through death, right? But just temporarily. You don't really slay the titanic nature until you graduate from its influence, right? Third, fourth initiation stuff, right? Next, from the ashes of the Titans, he formed mankind whose purpose of existence was to preserve and eventually to release the Bacchic idea or rational soul from the titanic manifestation or titanic fabrication. So um, ashes are the result of substance and fire, the components of a human being. The eventual release comes through the path of evolution, uh, whether forced through initiation or experienced as a progression through the root races, globes, and chains. Taylor expands on this idea. Can we get a reader, please? Yes, and Veronica, can you read that for us, please? Hello, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. As the Titans are the artificers of things and stand next in order to their creations, men are said to be composed from their fragments because the human soul has a partial life capable of proceeding to the most extreme division united with its proper nature. And while the soul is in a state of servitude to the body, she lives confined, as it were, in bonds through the dominion of the titanical life. We may observe further concerning these dramatic shows of the lesser mysteries that as they were intended to represent the condition of the soul while subservient to the body, we shall find that the liberation from this servitude through the purifying disciplines, potencies that separate from evil was that the wisdom of the ancients intended to signify by the descent of Hercules Elysses, Orpheus, etc., into Addis and, they, and their speedy return from its dark abodes. Hence, says Proclus, Heracles, being purified by sacred initiation, obtained at length a perfect establishment among the gods. That is well known, the dreadful condition of his soul while in captivity to a corporeal nature and purifying himself by practice of the cleansing virtues of which certain purification in the mystic ceremonies were symbolical. He at length was freed from the bondage of matter and ascended beyond her reach. On this account, it is said of him that he dragged the three mouth dog Cerberus to upper day, uh, intimating that by temperance, continence and the other virtues, he drew upwards the intuition, intuitional, rational, and op, op, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I can't say that. That's, that's fine, opinionative, opinionative. Opinionative part of the soul, sorry. Just means that which can form opinions, right? Yes. Um, right, so it's interesting here just to look at the, um, the three-headed or three-mouthed dog uh, as representing the, the three lower planes of, of our, you know, our personality nature, right? Sort of a duh factor, but there it is. Thank you, Anna Veronica. I always uh, uh, learn how to pronounce certain words. Like, how, how do you pronounce Hercules again? Er, Hercules? Heracles. 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 Elysis is Odysseus. 
Uh, Orpheus is Orpheus. Uh, Hades is Addis. Addis, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Proclus, uh, uh, oh, oh God. Uh, uh, Pro Procolo, Pro uh, I'm sorry, that I don't remember. Uh, oh, we, have, okay. we have here, there is one person that knows very well here about uh, uh, pronunciation. Now about the, the Greek um, Greek mythology, much better than me, so uh, we, we, we have helped now <laughs> in many ways. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you for the reading. Uh, any thoughts or questions about this? Jupiter, who is the Roman version of the Greek Zeus, represents, according to MPH in his article from the winter 1945 edition of Horizon Magazine, quote, the laws governing mundane creation. These laws are broken, Zeus, Jupiter. Remember, the Jupiter used here is, is not that uh, second ray sacred planet it's it's the roman version of zeus okay um so the orientation here is um uh that he represents the laws governing mundane creation right so when these laws are broken, Zeus Jupiter uses the thunderbolt to destroy the disruptive influence, thus allowing the natural order to be restored. So, could we get a reader? This is an interesting um, theosophical glossary entry on the thunderbolt. Um, yes. Scott, can you read that for us? But before you do, I would like to read um, Efrosini's uh, comment. She says, it is interesting that ancient thought aimed at the liberation of the spirit from form, but after the Pisces era in Christianity, the purpose of the incarnation is the salvation of matter. They're the same thing. It's just a difference in emphasis, right? Um, you could say that the will to be of the Logos, who is on his own plane, completely beyond the vagaries of materialism, is the salvation of the little lives. You know, all the lives, for instance, that participate in your form aspect, all three of them, are being uplifted by your incarnation. Uh, and yet, as that goes on, you. Um, strive to, um, through, quote, the cleansing virtues, you know, to um, uh, become, uh, re-become one with your soul nature. So the two go hand in hand. It's just a difference in emphasis. Anyone else? Okay. Can we get a reader, please? Scott? Uh, yeah, I was going to say um, that dragging, dragging up of Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades is the same thing. Yeah. Three, three lower parts of the personality, which are on one side of the river, and he's bringing them up on the other side into the light of day. It's, it's redeeming matter. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, and, you know, more so by the fact that it, you know, was a member of the animal kingdom, right? Yeah. Okay. This is Zeus hurling a thunderbolt from Dodona, Epirus, Greece. Thunderbolt. Jupiter Tonans, Jupiter the Thunderer, was an as one aspect of the Roman Lord of Heaven. Indra in India was wielder of the thunderbolt. Atmospheric thunder is a manifestation of electricity, heat, light, and sound and must have its correspondences on higher cosmic planes. Okay, I'm going to, inter to interrupt right there. That's what we were talking about before when we were talking about the different natures of Fohat. Must have its correspondences on higher cosmic planes, right? It reveals itself as thunder, you know, uh, and lightning on the physical plane. Uh, but this same directed cleansing quality exists on every plane. Go ahead, please. Sure. Nature being a hierarchy composed of almost innumerable subordinate entities is under the strict governance or law of divine intelligences. 
so that nothing whatsoever happens haphazardly. From this viewpoint, the thunderbolt is an actual discharge of energy reaching objectivization, not by chance, but in accordance with intelligence causation or law, not by inscrutable fate, by, but by past actions whose effects in time produce the thunderbolt. The same reasoning applies to other natural phenomena, such as earthquakes, tidal waves, sinkings of continents, volcanoes, and on a smaller scale, such life-giving and fructifying events as rains, sunshine, storms, and those continuous but non-destructive electrical interchanges, which are so largely instrumental in producing the varied phenomena of life around us. Thank you, Scott. Any thoughts or questions about this? Yeah, it's, you know, so much of this is to is oriented towards um, trying to pry us loose from our literal mindedness in terms of the the um, symbolism, right? I mean, if unless you the more you do this, the more you develop the habit of thinking beyond the literal. And, you know, here's another example of how important that is. Okay. Francis. Yeah. Sorry. Um, F. Rossini says thunder is also a symbol of the first ray, the will of God that cleanses and destroys. Actually, more lightning, but yeah, the thunder would be more second ray, um, which follows the, the the lightning, right? The sound aspect, which follows the initial impulse. And then Greg has yeah. his hand up. Um, yeah, uh, when you spoke about the natural disasters like earthquakes, sinkings of continents, tidal waves, volcanoes, and even to the degree lightning, I mean, we always associate lightning as something that's random, but in terms of the greater environmental aspects and of living in this world and through its interpretation, what what this is saying is that it's not as necessarily random as we might think that there is an order that comes and like in the same idea that the same reason that he applies to other natural phenomena. So there is a reasoning that maybe they believe that there was a natural order in why these occurrences would happen. Right, you know, you could say that the, the natural universe, the natural, what's the word I'm looking for, nature in general, is responsive to uh, the, um, the behest of causal powers. It's, it's naturally responsive to causal potencies. And so it naturally manifests um, those potencies. And when we become, quote, rational, unquote, we too become a natural agent for those potencies, which nature is naturally. What's interesting is to look at these on the higher planes, like, you know, what does the thunderbolt look like on the mental plane or, you know, higher? It's, you know, and the another difference here is that these are directed energies by a logos. And so they're going to be obviously intelligently directed with very specific purpose. But then he goes on to say that, you know, all of nature, uh, all natural phenomenon um, is responsive to such an impulse, right? Thank you, Greg. Anyone else? I saw Yvonne's hand up for a minute and then it went down. Did you have a question, Yvonne? Uh, just along the same lines uh, that all these natural phenomenon, uh, um, not by chance, but in accordance with intelligent causation, yeah. not by inscrutable fact, past action. Same reason applies to natural phenomena. So I'm thinking of all the natural phenomena going on, the earthquakes, the tidal mm -hmm. waves, and everything. Uh, yeah. By uh, by man's actions, but by past actions whose effects in time produce the thunderbolt 
for good or for evil. It's all by past actions. That we yeah, and it's interesting. Um, gosh, where did I read this? Just recently, I read that that karma is inherent in substance itself. Uh, and I think we read that at a recent webinar. I don't know. Um, meaning that it's not somebody on a higher plane doing something to you because you did this or that. It's inherent in substance and action itself. Therefore, it becomes like gravity. It's just a law of nature, right? Uh, the quality. And so all of these things you mentioned, you know, all these um, natural phenomena are the same. They're, they're inherent reactions uh, to substance itself or the substantive world our actions. Anyone else? Okay. Can we get a reader, please? Yvonne, can you read, please? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> the Ancient Mysteries and Secret Societies, the Bacchic and Dion, Dionys, Dio, how do you say that? Dionysiac writes, but you don't have to read the titles. You can just start with okay. man. Man is a composite creature, his lower nature consisting of the fragments of the titans, and his higher nature, the sacred, immortal flesh, life of Bacchus. Therefore, man is capable of either a titanic, irrational, or a Bacchic, rational existence. The titans of Hesiod, who were 12 in number, are probably analogous to the celestial zodiac whereas the titans who murdered and dismembered Bacchus represent the zodiacal powers distorted by their involvement in the material world. Thus Bacchus represents the sun who is dismembered by the signs of the zodiac and from whose body the universe is formed. When the terrestrial forms were created from the various parts of his body, the sense of wholeness was lost and the sense of separateness established. The heart of Bacchus, which was saved by Pallas or Minerva, was lifted out of the four elements symbolized by his dismembered body and placed in the ether. The heart of Bacchus is the immortal center of the rational soul. Okay, a lot of the same teachings, except for that he, he kicks it upstairs when he talks about um, the titans who murdered and dismembered Bacchus represent zodiacal powers distorted by their involvement. So it also all as above, so below, you know, these, the Bacchic influence permeates all creation, not just um, those of us who have not yet reached soul levels of awareness, but um, any entity who participates in incarnation has both a Bacchic and Titanic nature. So noting humanity's dual nature, MPH brings it all home here. As Bob Dylan says, well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Actually disciples express both the Bacchic and Titanic lives simultaneously with the eventual goal of using the Titanic or personality life, the fragmented life, to express the Bacchic self, right? Next, the Titans of Hesiod, who were 12 in number, are probably analogous to the celestial zodiac. In the winter 1949 issue of Horizon, um, MPH says, the Titans, the 12 primordial forces of chaos, later became rationalized in the Zodiac. Rational is here used, and I've been over this, means aligned with cosmic ideation. Opposite this quote is an illustration of the transformation of chaos into the rational Zodiac by the 18th century artist, Bernard Picart. In the detail, you can make out the Leo Aquarius and Sag Gemini polarities. Here's that. Here's Gemini down here. Sag up here. Here's Leo and Aquarius, right? Uh, 
this drawing right. comes from yeah sorry um christine says note the author c hiram abiff the head of masonics the author note the author did you say yeah that's what she says note the author c hiram abiff um I don't know where she gets that. Okay, let's ask her. Christine? Yeah, I just uh, noticed it. It's on, on the page we just left. Uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages was an initiate of this society. Uh, I, I asked you about this before. I was told this by a, uh, the Freemason the head of the Freemason that I knew at the society. And, uh, you know, that's who they honor. Yeah. Um, we're actually going to be looking at that C. Hiram. And when we study Vitruvius, you know, the uh, Dionysical architects were coming up. Um, it's actually right down here. You're jumping ahead. Is this where you were looking? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, we don't read the gray yet, but we'll, well. get there. <laughs> You're a fast reader. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is um, maybe one of you Masons. I know Scott is a Mason. Could tell us a little more about that when we get there. But uh, let's stick with the program for now. Um, thanks for the reference. Sorry, um, I thought it was related. but It, it will be. It is. Of course, it's all related, but um, we'll get there in, in due time. All right. So I think this is a beautiful illustration showing that sort of intermediate stage between the chaos, right, or primordial forces in their um, becoming a zodiac. So, yeah, um, this drawing comes from an extraordinary book of illustrations called um, Tempel der Zang Godenen, and uh, this terrible German, but there you have it. Here are a couple of more illustrations from the same book. First, the Titans attempt to scale heaven by piling mountains one upon another. Not just rocks, but mountains. And Orpheus leading Eurydice out of hell, looks back upon her and loses her forever. So next up, um, when the terrestrial forms were created from the various parts of this body, the sense of wholeness was lost and the sense of separateness established. Here we go. Um, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, thus, Bacchus represents the sun who is dis dismembered by the signs of the zodiac and from whose body the universe is formed. This sentence describes the macrocosmic version of the Bacchic rites, wherein the zodiacal titans divided the sun into 12 parts. Like humankind, the physical sun takes part in the titanic material nature. Thus, its Bacchic nature is one of sacrifice. And now we have, when the terrestrial forms were created from the various parts of the body, the sense of wholeness was lost and the sense of separateness established. Okay. The his in his body is the sun. The quote, various parts of his body are the principles represented by the subplanes of the cosmic physical plane all aspects of the sun. It is these principles that make up a human being. Hence the physical sun and an incarnated human being both lose their sense of wholeness by participating in titanic existence. It's all relative. This last quote on the heart of Bacchus references the imprisoned soul the embedded essence, which is, quote, saved when reunited with the soul on its own plane, 
represented by Pallas, who is Neith, the Egyptian goddess of redemption, by means of the evolutionary path. Decay describes it as that inner evolutionary attribute, which must eventually sweep it into line with divine purpose. That's a good definition of the um, Bacchic principle, inner evolutionary attribute, which must eventually sweep it into line with divine purpose. Okay, next up. Can we get a reader, please? Uh, yes, Greg, can you read that for us, please? Yeah. Um, after the rational soul had been distributed throughout creation and the nature of man, the Bacchic mysteries were instituted for the purpose of disentangling it from the irrational titanic nature. This disentanglement was the process of lifting the soul out of the state of separateness into that of unity. The various parts and members of Bacchus were collected from the different corners of the earth. When all the rational parts are gathered, Bacchus is resurrected. The rites of Dionysios were very similar to those of Bacchus, and by many, these two gods are considered as one. Statues of the Dionysos were carried in the Eleusinian mysteries, especially the lesser degrees. Bacchus, representing the soul of the mundane sphere, was capable of an infinite multiplicity of form and designations. Dionysos apparently was his solar aspect. Thank you, Greg. So here's an Eleusinian procession honoring Iacus, who is a ceremonial form of Dionysus. MPH gives us a, a closer look at the, um, at the Bacchic rites themselves in this winter 1949 issue of Horizon. Can we get a reader for this, please? Uh, yes, Joan, can you read that for us, please? These mysteries were divided into three grades as follows. One, the meeting and overcoming of the Minotaur, the bull man, a rite of purification which took place in subterranean crypts called labyrinths, symbolizing the complexities of the physical world and the confusion of the physical body. The Minotaur is the animal soul, which rules in the dark, torturous underworld, a sphere divided into numerous passageways and chambers where there was no guide and no help. The neophyte must battle with the shadows and conquer by courage and wisdom. This grade reveals the struggle against ignorance by which the individual gains freedom from the monster which forever demands the homage of the ignorant. Two, the child Bacchus is involved in the right of the human soul. The ritual took place in a broad plain near the shores of a sea and was given at night. In this mystery of the Bacchic rite, the intellect is established in various forms of essential knowledge. The apex of the rite was the achievement of philosophy. Those who accomplished this were called the mystai, those who perceive through a veil. This veil could not be lifted until the human consciousness was elevated above the limitations of the material state. Three, this degree was the highest and most secret and was reserved for those who had perceived the deep mysteries of the soul. It was the rite of the midnight sun. The neophyte perceived the sun shining at midnight beneath the earth, as though under his feet. Dionysus is this night sun, the Lord of the highest degree of the mysteries. He is the divine soul, which is elevated above human concern and has mingled itself with the divine light. 
This light in darkness is the light within, by which all external things must be illumined. Thank you. Any thoughts or questions? A little insight into the into the actual Bacchic rites. Okay. Finally, and here's where C. Hiram Abif comes in. Um, we come to the last paragraph of NPH's rather brief commentary on the Bacchic rites, which also concludes the third chapter of the book. In it, we switch subjects in this paragraph, we switch subjects from the Bacchic mysteries to a school of ancient architects that had the name of Dionysius. Could we get a reader for this? I'll read it. Uh, the Dionysiac architects constituted an ancient secret society in principles and doctrines, much like the modern Freemasonic order. They were an organization of builders bound together by their secret knowledge of the relationship between the earthly and the divine science of architectonics. They were supposedly employed by King Solomon in the building of his temple, although they were not Jews, nor did they worship the God of the Jews, being followers of Bacchus and Dionysus. The Dionysiac architects erected many of the great monuments of antiquity. They possessed a secret language and a system of marking their stones. They had annual convocations and sacred feasts. The exact nature of their doctrines is unknown. It is believed that C. Hiram Abiff was an initiate of this society. Okay, any thoughts or questions on this last paragraph? Perhaps the greatest influence within the, this precursor to the Freemasons was Vitruvius. Uh, for greater insight into how the society, the society of, now I know we're out of time, but uh, we're right at the end of this. Um, so I'd like to, um, gosh, can we do this? Yeah, this is it. If you're willing to read this one quote. So let's do it. Let's push. Um, so for greater insight into how this society of Dionysiac architects impacted future generations, let's take a look at this quote from The Initiates of Greece and Rome by MPH. Can we get a, a reader, please? Karen, can you read that for us, please? It is usual to include Vitruvius among the initiates of the Dionysian rites <clears throat> excuse me, and to recognize him as a moving spirit in those confederations of builders which flourished in Syria, Persia, and even India, if we are to credit the reports of Strabo. It is probable that the restoration of the secret societies in the 10th century was responsible for the renewed interest in the Vitruvian canons and the sudden appearance of manuscripts relating to them. We are not entirely certain that the so-called Vitruvian formulas originated with one man, for it is quite possible that they were the productions of an association rather than of an individual. An examination of the works themselves reveals considerable evidence that they are the compilation or accumulation of the choicest secrets of the old initiate builders arranged conveniently and aboundingly in hints and implications relating to the esoteric tradition. Through the outward structure, structure of the Vitruvian canons, we perceive the outlines of a mathematical and geometrical pattern of mystical and Kabbalistical analogies. The temple is the microcosm of the universe revealed through the dimensions and proportions of the human body. The important edition of De Architectura Tura, published in 1521 under the editorship of Cesar, Cesarino, contains two plates especially symbolical. 
These figures representing the human body extended on a background of small squares are reminiscent of certain mystical measurements established by Pythagoras. The, divine, the designs of Cesarino appear with only slight modifications among the anatomical canons of Leonardo da Vinci and the rare text on artistic autonomy compiled by Albrecht Dura. Anatomy, yeah. Thank you, um, Karen. Okay, any thoughts or questions about this uh, reading? Yes, um, Efrosini says, I wonder if there were temples of Dionysus in antiquity as there were temples of Poseidon, Athena, Zeus, because all the ceremonies of Dionysus took place in the wild on the tops of the mountains. Yeah, exactly. I, I think for that reason, it's, it's, well, you know, basically they're unknown. We don't, you know, we don't know. Like the, the typical Greek gods each and often have more than one temple um, that has been found that we know was ascribed to them. But uh, at least in my understanding, that's not true of, of uh, Orpheus, uh, Bacchus, or Dionysius. Yeah, it's a good point. Anyone else? That's, That's all why, I you see. know, okay. Um, here's a couple of additional illustrations from, right? He says here the important addition of de architectura, de, de architectura. Uh, so here's a couple of um, illustrations from that, that de, uh, book, both revealing the hidden but guiding geometries of Vitruvius. And of course, this informed the building of cathedrals in, um, you know, starting in the uh, 11th, 12th centuries, right? Um, these types of hidden dimensions. Francis? Yeah. Uh, Efrosini asks, I wonder how Dionysus is associated with architecture while he had no temples. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there's... Um, what we know is that the this group, see this this group called the Dionysian architects is other than those of uh, Dionysian mystery um, um, schools, right? This came later, and it was by means of of that school um, that all the ancient architecture from a certain point was uh, derived. And it could just be a, that they were, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that he says that uh, even though they, he worked for um, the, um, um, what's this, there? let me find that. Uh, Let me find it here. That even though it was, you know, he worked for the, the under the, um, the Jewish influence, what's the name I'm looking for here? Um, it was nonetheless that they were schooled in the Dionysian um, mysteries. But um, I would say that it's a, a, a later group they came together and it, it's, you know, it's an, it's an interesting anomaly that, like you said, they formed the, uh, the very basis of what would become all the great uh, churches of the uh, Middle Ages when, you know, the, they themselves did not uh, worship in such structures. So can't tell you just what the, you know, how that works out. And then Jesse says, all of nature is a temple if we could but see it. Well, you know, in all these um, proportions can also be found in nature. And maybe that's the best answer to the question, right? That the um, proportions such as phi 
are found all throughout nature and are used in, in all of these um, future temples, right? All the temples that appear in these books by uh, that are known to have been inspired by Vitruvius um, it came into being much later. Right? Okay. Um, and Christine says Fibonacci. Yeah, Fibonacci is is the is based on phi. Okay, so any final questions on um, the bio, the Bacchic and Dionysian rites? Fascinating. Um, final look at the Greek mysteries. We've been at this for some time now, uh, looking at the Orphic and the Eleusinian, and finally these the Bacchic. Um, and next, we're going to be turning the page, and we could be looking at next time at Atlantis. So the illustration on the left, we've already covered through um, um, Odin. It's sort of out of sequence with the book. But um, our next subject is the next chapter on Atlantis and the gods of antiquity. So I wanted to get to this point, even though I kept you a little late. And for that, I apologize. So <laughs> um, could we get um, the dates for next time? I think it's next week, isn't it? For Yeah, next week is the Secret Doctrine, um, the 16th of May uh, at 7 p.m. GMT. And then the next uh, Secret Teaching of All Ages will be the 6th of June. So we're back to our first uh first and third sunday right 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 so the yeah. 6th of june will be the next one of these where we start um on atlantis okay real good um we'll see you hopefully see you all next week otherwise um on the 6th of june already june my goodness okay thank you all much appreciate your attendance bye bye Bye, everyone. Oops. Bye. Bye, Carrie.